21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, what's the trouble? Is there any identification on a person? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what does she say when you ask her who she is? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A yeah. call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. We'll bring her into the station house. Stay there. I'll send a car around for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a busy night in the precinct with plenty of work, but by the time the 12 to 8 platoon reported for duty at midnight, things had quieted down. At 2.15 a.m., I returned to the station house from patrol. Then, because there was a meeting of all precinct commanders in the borough scheduled for 9 a.m., I lay down on the couch in my office to get a few hours sleep. Meanwhile, patrol of the precinct continued with 62 men on the job assigned to sector cars or on foot. Among these was patrolman Edward Farrell assigned to post number 6, which included three blocks along Lexington Avenue in the 80s. At 2.55 a.m., he was walking his post when a slightly built man dressed in a white apron and jacket hurried from behind to catch him. Officer, policeman. Yeah, what is it? I'm Josh from the bar girl up there, Gentleys. Yeah? Elliot, the night bartender, sent me out to see if you were in the block. What's the trouble? Well, there's no trouble exactly. It's just what you call a, a peculiar situation. What? Well, we're getting ready to close up. We got to clean up and everything, and she just sits there. Who? I don't know who she is. She don't even know herself. That's a peculiar situation. Oh. Elliot thinks she's got what you call amnesia. She has, not and, and she's a pretty little thing. Prettiest little thing you ever saw. That's it there. Okay. She just sits there, staring with them eyes. See? Over there, in the back booth. That's her. I see. Well, what have we got, Elliot? That's what I'd like to know. She came in here about 11 o'clock. I'd say it was closer to 10.30. Well, around then, I kind of looked at her when she came in. You know, she's not a bad-looking dish. Well, she walked to that booth way back there, and there she sits yet. She hasn't moved hardly an inch. Not drunk, is she? Are you kidding? She ordered one drink when she came in, and there it still sits in front of her. She hasn't touched it. All the ice melted and everything. There it sits. <laughs> How do you like this? The one night the whole gang cleans out early before closing time, and I aren't hanging around here crying for one more drink. The first night that happens in two weeks, and I think I'm going to get out early, this has to hit me. Did you talk to her? Yeah, I talked to her. We both talked to her. What'd she say? She don't make sense. She doesn't know her name? She don't know anything. Well, she looks like she should know something. Pretty girl. And those are nice clothes she's got on. Yeah? Uh, look, look I, I could put her out on the street, you know. But she might be sick. I didn't want to take the chance on doing that. I could just go over there and say, uh, Oh, okay, honey, closing time. And she'd be out on the street. But if something's wrong with her, I just don't want that to be on my conscience. All right, let me talk to him. Get busy, Josh. Start sweeping up. Let's get out of here early. That's okay with me. You two stay here. I never complain about getting out early. Hi there. Hello. Hello. I understand you're not feeling so well. I feel all right, officer. Oh, that's good. What's your name? We'll see if we can get you home. I don't know. Oh, now, come on. Everybody knows their own name. Well, I don't know mine, if I have one. All right. Uh, where do you live? I don't know that either. Don't you have any idea? No. Nope. Well, what do you know? <laughs> well, it seems I know a lot of things until I start to think about them, then I don't know much. Well, do you know who's president of the United States? Oh, yes, sure. Don't be silly. Well, who is? General Eisenhower. Good, good. 
Who's Bing Crosby? Uh, you know who he is? Of course. Who is he? He's a singer. Uh-huh. What about Willie Mays? Willie Mays? Yeah. Well, I never heard of him. He's a ball player. New York Giants. Oh, I don't know anything about baseball. Well, if you don't know what your name is and where you live, how do you know you don't know anything about baseball? I guess because I never heard of Willie Mays. Yeah. <laughs> That's logical. I think it is. Let's see if we can find out who you are. Do you have a pocketbook? No, what? A pocketbook. A purse. No, I don't have any. You sure? Well, it would be here, wouldn't it? Well, uh, what have you got in the pockets of your coat? Oh, not much. Oh, well, let's see. Put everything on the table. Right there? Mm-hmm. Put it out there. Oh, all right. The handkerchief and a little money. Mm-hmm. About six bucks and some change. Mm, yes, about. Now the uh, other pocket. All right. That's all just a compact and a lipstick. Is there a name on the outside of that compact? No. I, I looked at it before. You want to see? No, I can see. Open it up. Let's see what's inside. Well, it's just powder and a powder puff. Open it up anyway. All right. See? Just what I told you. Excuse me. Sweep and by. Sweep and by. All right, Josh. Take it easy. I can't. I sweep with gusto. Oh, he's really funny. He was making jokes before, trying to get me to laugh. <laughs> well, sometimes it helps. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't see any reason to. Mr. Farrell. Yeah? Can you come over here a minute? All right. You just sit there. I'll be right back. I wasn't planning on going anyplace. I've got no place to go. Yeah, we. What is it? Your sergeant's car is outside. Oh, yeah. He must be looking for you. Sergeant! Sergeant, I'm in here. All right. Was he looking for you? Yeah, I think so. Hey, what's with her, anyway? Beats me. Seems to be a pretty intelligent girl. Excuse me there, excuse me. Please. Listen, do you always have to sweep where somebody is? It's not that. It's just somebody's always where I'm sweeping. What are you doing in a case like this? First thing is to find out who she is. She doesn't look like she was in any accident or anything. Clothes are all clean. She's just as pretty as a picture. Just like she stepped off a bandwagon. Yeah? Listen, you don't think she's giving us the rib, do you? Could be. I read someplace that 90% of the amnesia cases are fakes. It's something like that. Wow. Yes, Sergeant, here. Well, what have you got? You know Elliot here, Sergeant Waters. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Oh. Some deal we've got. <laughs> got a woman back there, Sergeant. Says she doesn't know her name or where she lives. You think she's on the level? Got me. Do you know her, Elliot? No, I've never seen her before. She's never been in here. I wish she didn't come in tonight. All right. Let's talk to her, Farrell. That's what I've been trying to do, Sergeant. Hi. Hello. Sergeant Waters. This is Miss... You know, if I work for a living, I must not work in a factory. Or I must not be a typist. Look at those long nails. They're really very nice, aren't they? Yes, they are. I'm kind of worried about not knowing who I am. Especially because I know so many other things. <laughs> of course, I didn't know about Willie Mays, did I? No. Ask me some more. Let's see what else I know. You know how old you are? Well, I know about how old I am. All right. About how old I am. When I was in the ladies' room before I looked in the mirror, I would say that I'm between 20 and 25. What's your birthday? Uh, I don't know. What made you come in here? Well, I was walking around and I got very tired and I wanted to sit down someplace, so I just came in and sat down. You didn't drink any of your drink? I really didn't want it, but I thought I ought to order something. Don't you drink? Oh, I don't really know. Maybe I do and maybe I don't. The reason I didn't drink any of it is because if I don't drink, I didn't want to start now. Would you like a cigarette? No, no, thanks. I don't know whether I smoke either. This is really very nice of you to bother like this. It's considerate when people go out of their way to help someone else. It's all part of the job, lady. Oh, yes, I guess it is. How do I find out who I am? There are ways. Well, how, for instance? Well, we can take your fingerprints... You can have them checked out here and in Washington. Oh, that won't do any good. I was never fingerprinted before. 
You have to have been fingerprinted before you can find out who someone is that way, don't you? If you don't remember anything, how do you know you've never been fingerprinted before? Well, I, I really don't know for sure. Well, how could you even guess that you weren't? Because my memory might be gone, but my intuition isn't. My intuition tells me I've never been fingerprinted before. And your intuition is probably right. Probably. But most likely, someone will have reported a young woman about your age, height, weight, and coloring missing. We'll have that description on file. If it matches, we'll just get hold of that person and have them come down to meet you. Who would that person be, for instance? Oh, mother, father, husband. Do you think I'm married? I wonder if I am. Well, you don't have on a wedding ring. No, I don't, do I? But that's not necessarily a sure sign. There are lots of women who are married that don't wear wedding rings. I wonder if I am married. I know what kind of man I'd like to be married to. Uh, listen. Yeah? Uh, does this happen very often? I mean, people losing their memory like I did? Oh, yeah. There's hundreds of cases like that every year in the city of New York. New York? Yeah, that's right. Am I in New York? You sure are. Oh, you're kidding me. Are you from someplace other than New York? Well, I know I'm not from New York. If I lived in New York, I'd know it. That, that's one thing someone would know, to live in a city like New York. Don't you think? I mean, even if they didn't know their own name or where they lived. I mean, that, the, what address. They'd know they were from New York City. All right, sure, you're not from New York City. That's um... On the other hand, I might be. If I don't know who I am or where I live, I might very well be from New York, although I don't think I am. Isn't that reasonable? Miss, I'm beginning not to know what's reasonable and what isn't. Excuse me, sweeping through there, please. Hey, Josh, get away from there. All right, all right. Sweeping through. Excuse me, please. Well, uh, have you decided what you're going to do with me? I mean, what happens to me where I go? Well, right now, you're going to the station house. And from there? That depends on how fast you remember who you are. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You made a little remark to a friend one day, and it got passed around. By the time it reached the authorities, it had been twisted and changed, so that it wasn't your statement anymore. But that didn't make any difference. You were hauled into the prison, forced to sign a confession that you couldn't even read, and found guilty of uttering poisonous and dangerous remarks. The verdict? Guilty. The sentence? Ten years at hard labor. But what about the right of free speech, you say? Yes, that's exactly why such a thing could not happen to you. But it is happening in some countries today. The difference between these countries and yours is that you are guaranteed the right to free speech. Now get that word guaranteed. You're not allowed, not permitted, but guaranteed the right to say what you want, where you want, any time you want. It's in the first article of your Bill of Rights. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The lecture halls and the auditorium, the soapbox in the park, the conversations among friends, well, they're all examples of free speech. They had their birth in the town meetings of our ancestors. They'll still be there for our children and for future generations. No one can take it away from us or from them. No one can make a law against free speech. It's guaranteed to us. Permanently. It's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. The established function of the Detective Division, Police Department, City of New York, is the investigation of crime. Only one other specific duty is assigned the detectives. That is, the location of missing persons and establishing the identity of unidentified persons. The specialists in this field are detectives in the Missing Persons Bureau one of the several central office bureaus and squads. But each case is still the responsibility of detectives in the precinct in which it originates. The young woman, an apparent amnesia victim, was brought to the station house in the custody of patrolman Farrell. There, at the direction of the desk officer, she was taken to the 21st detective squad on the second floor. In the meantime, I had awakened and walked out into the muster room where Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty and Lieutenant Harry Snyder was desk officer. You didn't sleep long, Captain. Oh, I did well enough. What's doing? It's been pretty quiet, Captain. That's good. I think I'll go out on patrol, oh, Lieutenant. You got a car handy? Yeah, sure, Captain. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have number three come by to take the Captain on patrol. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you want, Sergeant? Uh, 
do you say, Lieutenant? Oh, hi. Uh, Joe Ford, sanitation department driver, District 8. Uh, what's the trouble, Joe? Uh, no trouble, Lieutenant. Uh, hello, Captain. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I found this in the trash basket at uh, 76 in Lexington. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was just laying there. I, uh... I figured a thief grabbed the purse off some lady, took the money out, and threw it away in a Department of Sanitation trash basket. Isn't that right, Captain? Well, that looks like about the story, huh? Uh, what was it, just laying on top? Uh, right in the basket. You, you know, like uh, somebody threw it in as they was uh, walking past. Yeah. Everything in here but money. Yeah. There's a wallet and a cigarette lighter. Surprised he didn't keep the lighter. Well, usually all thieves want is cash. And all kinds of identification in there. A woman lives in Maryland. There's a car registration, operator's license, and all that. Okay, Joe, we'll check it out. Uh, good. Uh, you know my name, Joe Board, Department of Sanitation, District 8? Yeah, Joe, I'll put it on the report. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Well, don't mention it, Captain, any time. Well, I'll uh, get back to hustling ash can. See you. Okay. A nice-looking pocketbook, Captain. Yeah. And a nice wallet. But she lost quite a few bucks. Yes, sir, quite a few bucks. You know what this... Uh, Leather in the wallet is ostrich. Genuine ostrich. Yeah. That's the most expensive stuff to make wallets out of. Uh, Captain, car's in on the way for you. Okay. What's the name in there? Maryland operator's license. Evelyn B-U-R-G-E-S, age 24, Sage Hill Road, Hobart, Maryland. Yeah. Blonde hair, blue eyes, 5 feet 2 inches, 108 pounds. Well, I wouldn't care if she walked in here right now, Captain. It's been a dull night. Uh, the same on the registration? Yes, sir. Evelyn Burgess, Hobart, Maryland. Oh. Probably visiting New York, and somebody grabbed her purse. Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. Hello, Harry. What's it doing? Awful quiet, Matt. Captain. Oh, Matt. What are you doing in at this time of morning? Oh, they rang me up at home. The 15th squad collared a boy who's probably good for half those apartment house burglaries we've been having. Went down to talk to him, see if he could clear a few. How'd you do? He, uh, don't know nothing. But we went to his flat, and he's up to his ears there in radios, clothes, typewriters, everything. Beside a fistful of pawn tickets. We'll check our 61s against the stuff he's got, and I'll bet he's right for at least half those deals in this precinct. Good. Who's catching upstairs, Harry? Goldman, Matt. Has he been busy? No, nothing much, except Pharaoh came in with an amnesia victim a little while ago. Oh, one of those. Well, oh, uh, Captain... Yes, Matt? I've got those pictures of that bungalow out on the beach I'm considering. They came yesterday. Oh, have you? Got them up on my desk. Want to take a look at them? Yeah, I think I'd like to, Matt. Uh, ring me when the car comes, Sergeant. I'll be up in the detective squad. Yes, sir. It's a sweet little place, Captain. Well, according to your description, it sounds it. Half a block from the beach. Price is right. <laughs> what else do I want? Well, you'll never spend any time there, Matt. Well, I'll spend some time there. You sleep here more than you do at home now. Well, it'd be good for my wife and the kids. It'd be fine for them. Now, look, we want to help you. That's all we're trying to do. I know it. Hello, Goldman. Oh, uh, Lieutenant. Hello, Captain. Hi, Captain. Hi. What have you got? Farrell brought her in, Lieutenant. She was sitting in a bar and grill over on Lexington Avenue at closing time. She doesn't know who she is or where she lives or much of anything. Were you hurt, young lady? No, not that I know of. You getting a policewoman up here? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the desk officer phoned down to the 19th precinct for one. What do you need a policewoman for? Well, there might be some labels in your clothes that'll help us. I've got the pictures in my desk, Captain. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Well, I, I mean, supposing you can't find any labels in my clothes and supposing you can't find out who I am, what happens to me? You know, I, I can't sit around the police station all my life just because I don't know who I am. Well, uh, if we don't get some results very fast, we'll let the doctors try to see if they can help you remember. What doctors? Where? At Bellevue. You mean psychiatrists? Yes. They can find out what it's all about in a hurry. Oh. Okay, man. You see? It's got this porch all the way across the front. Oh, uh, just a second, lad. I, I want to talk to her. I really don't see any reason for a psychiatrist. Well, maybe he can help you. Excuse me, miss. Yes. Were you all alone when the officer came and talked to you? Yes, that's right, all alone. Mm -hmm. Where was this? In some bar. On Lexington Avenue? Well, I don't know exactly on what avenue. It was Lexington Avenue, Captain. What was your idea of going into a bar, Miss Burgess? Well, I went in there because... Because I wanted to... Uh... Sit down. I, I was tired. 
Your name is Evelyn Burgess, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know what my name is. You live on Sage Hill Road in Hobart, Maryland. Isn't that right? You wrapping one up for us, Captain? I think so, Matt. That's right, isn't it, Miss Burgess? That's where you live, isn't it? I don't know. You have blonde hair, blue eyes. You're about five feet, two inches, and you weigh about 108 pounds. Well, uh, what does that mean? Ordinarily, it wouldn't mean a thing. Now, look. We've got a woman's purse downstairs that was thrown away in a Department of Sanitation trash basket. There's a motor vehicle operator's license in there in the name of Evelyn Burgess. The description on there fits you. That doesn't mean anything either. I know. That doesn't mean much in itself. But the purse is made out of leather that exactly matches your belt and your shoes. Now, you don't want to carry this on any further, do you, Miss Burgess? It's Mrs. Burgess. This whole amnesia thing is just a fake. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. One great big face. When you first well, squad, what's the reason for it? Well... Uh, I... Excuse me, Captain. Sergeant Waters is ringing up here. He said the car's come by the house for you. Oh, well. Tell him I won't be going out on patrol now. Yes, sir. I Captain had a good said reason. Won't be going out on patrol now. A very good reason. Yeah. It better be good. You've wasted a lot of time for a lot of people. This officer is supposed to be out catching robbers... Don't mind helping people that really need help. We're glad to do it. You put on a fake act like this, how do you think we feel? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Carl. Can I get Miss Desk? I've got to type them 61. Oh, yeah, sure. All right, Miss Burgess, let's move over here. Come on to my office. Come on, Farrell. Yes, sir? I, I really didn't mean to do anybody any harm or, or cause any trouble. But you sure did. Well, I, I, I said I was sorry. Now, you want to sit down right there? Farrell, come here. Yes, sir? I don't think there'll be any arrest in this case. You better get back on the job. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. Where did that policeman go, that Mr. Farrell? He's very nice. He went back to work. You wasted enough of his time, didn't you? Yes, I guess I did. All right. What was the idea? Whose benefit was this for? Not ours. No, not yours. Whose then? Well, mine, I guess. All right, let's have it. Well, you see, I'm married to this boy. He, he's very nice. He, he lives down there in Hobart. Hobart, Maryland? Yes. His father's a lawyer, his grandfather's a lawyer, and he's a lawyer. They're the only lawyers in Hobart. And, and really, things get kind of dull. Oh, not my husband. I mean, Hobart. Nothing happens. Didn't you know that before you got married? Well, you see, I, I came from Baltimore. I, I met him there. That's where he went to school. I see. And we got married and we moved to Hobart. Well, it just got to be so bad that I had to come to Baltimore every once in a while to see my friends and my sisters, you know. It just got so bad I couldn't stand it. I, I had to get away from Hobart. Just a little relief from those same people and those same faces and the same smile in the grocery store and same everything. So today was one of the days I drove to Baltimore. Yeah. And while I was driving, I got to thinking, I never want to go back to Hobart again. So I left my car in the garage in Baltimore, and I got on a train, and I came to New York. I thought coming to New York would be best. Best for what? Well, best to get away from everything. I wasn't going back. I was never going back. I, I was going to get a job here. I was going to settle down. I was going to make a career for myself, and finally when I got good and established, I was going to write and tell them I wanted a divorce, and that would be it. I thought I could get into television or something like that. You sure got off to a fine start. You end up in a police station not 24 hours after you arrive. Well, that was really on purpose. Oh, was it? But I got to thinking maybe it wasn't a real brilliant idea. I'm inclined to agree with you. But anyway, I was determined to go through with it. I walked around, and then all of a sudden it was dinner time, and I knew that I had to eat alone. I had no one to keep me company and no one to eat with, and I got to thinking, well, maybe it really was a mistake, really a mistake. You certainly realized it a little late. I know I did. 
And I had to do something about it. How could I explain to him that I was in New York and how I got here and why I came and why I wasn't in Baltimore where I said I would be and everything like that? So you invented the amnesia story. Well, I couldn't think of anything else. Well, you could have thought of something more original. Well, I, I know it's not exactly something new, but he would have believed it. We had a auto accident two or three weeks ago. I, I wasn't hurt, but I did get a bump in the head. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. And well, it really wasn't anything. The doctor examined me, and he said I was all right. But I thought maybe my husband would take that into consideration and believe the story on account of it. And he'd come up to New York and get you. Yes, that was the idea. I, I really want him. I want to go back. I don't care about him living in Hobart. All I wanted was him. Honestly. That's the truth. You can say anything you want to say, but that's the truth. I, I want to go back to him. But what do we do about your wasting all our time here and making a false report to an officer? I didn't make any false report. Is there a law against telling someone I don't remember anything? There's no law against that. All I said was I didn't remember. Well, I guess she's got us there, man. Yeah, I guess she has. All right. I suppose we'll have to get in touch with your husband. Uh, what are you going to tell him? That you're here in the police station. Oh? Is there uh, anything else you want to tell him? I, I wish you'd tell him that I really didn't remember my name and that I didn't know where I was or how I got here. Oh, you'll have to tell him that yourself. Can I do that? You can tell him anything you want. Well, I hope it works. I just hope it works. Oh, I don't think you have anything to worry about. You'll manage. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hit a what? A fire hydrant? Was anyone hurt? How bad? Where is this? Madison and what? Where's the driver of the car? Well, is water escaping? Is it knocked off completely? All right. I'll send the officers right over. Yeah. Okay. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Gillespie, Bill Quinn, Lawson Zerby, Frank Campanella, and Bill Lipton. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. 21st Precinct has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.